What are the effects of upwelling? Well, this moves nutrients from the bottom of the ocean upwards. This gives the organisms lots of food. This leads to great fishing grounds. So the best fishing grounds in the world, just uh, take a look at the red dots from an ocean perspective, not necessarily fresh water. Okay, now I have a longish video from oceanographer Professor Sean Chamberlain at Fullerton College. He talks about this Ekman effect in upwelling. So he's going to tie it all together, I think, with his uh, amazing discussion that we're going to listen to right now. I want to talk now about something called Ekman Transport. And Ekman Transport is really the driving force, in some sense, behind the surface circulation. It's also the driving force behind this phenomenon that I've been alluding to called upwelling. And in understanding Ekman Transport, and really understanding just you know, superficially the details of it, or what it does, will better help you understand surface circulation and understand the phenomenon of upwelling and the kinds of conditions under which we get upwelling. So we'll go into a little bit more detail than we probably have to on Ekman transport, but it combines things we already know about Coriolis effect um, and those kinds of things. And so it's an important way of understanding it, some of the physical mechanisms that cause some of the things that we see out in the ocean. This idea of Ekman transport and um, this idea of Ekman's really came about by a famous explorer called Fritjof Nansen. And Nansen is one of Tommy Dickey's most favorite explorers for a couple different reasons. In fact, Tommy loves Nansen so much he even named one of his dogs after him. So um, that's devotion for you. But as it turns out, Nansen wasn't only just famous as an oceanographer and as a polar explorer, but he was also the only oceanographer the only oceanographer to ever win a Nobel Prize. He won a Nobel Peace Prize, and he didn't win it for his oceanography, so maybe that's kind of cheating, that calling an oceanographer a winner of a Nobel Peace Prize. But nonetheless, his extraordinary efforts during World War II to take care of immigrants and to bring people from uh, Germany, out of Germany, and other places, uh, led him to be awarded the Nobel Peace Prize as a result of that. Again, an extraordinary man. Our concern with Nansen here is an observation that he made while he was aboard his ship, the Fram. The Fram is a round bottom ship, and with its round bottom, when you're exploring polar oceans, they are always susceptible to freezing, and when the sea ice freezes, if you have a V-shaped hull, it's going to crush your hull. Well, the Norwegians figured that out a long time ago, so they build their polar exploration vessels as a round bottom hull. So when the ocean freezes, the boat just pops up on top of the ice and just drifts with the sea ice up until the sea ice melts and the ship can sail away again. And so aboard his Fram, what Nansen observed was that as the wind was blowing, the ice moved off 20 to 30 degrees in a different direction than the direction of the wind. And he thought that very curious because normally you would think that, of course, that a blowing wind would blow an object in the direction of the wind. So he came home and he told this to uh, Wilfred Ekman, who happened to be a mathematician, and Ekman was aware of the Coriolis effect, so deflection to the right, should start thinking about some things there, and Ekman put it all together into a mathematical formulation for which he is now famous. So his reasoning was somewhat like this. As the wind blows across the surface of the ocean, it sets the ocean in motion, but the ocean doesn't move directly in the direction of the wind, it moves off slightly to the right. And as he, it moves off slightly to the right, it drags the layer beneath it, which even moves more to the right, and more to the right, and more to the right, and eventually the result is layers of water that are all moving in different directions from the surface to depth in what has now come to be known as the Ekman Spiral. It really wasn't until 1995 that we were actually able to measure the Ekman spiral in the ocean. And we'll see a picture of that in just a second. Let's explore what the Ekman spiral looks like. If we consider the ocean as a series of layers, different layers from surface to bottom, what we find is that as the wind blows across, because of the Coriolis effect, remember in the Coriolis effect, northern hemisphere right, the water on the surface moves off at an angle to the wind. 
that surface water, that layer moving, moves the layer beneath it through friction, but because that layer is moving, it begins also to turn to the right. The layer beneath it moves and it turns to the right, layer beneath it, and so on, all the way down. We can use cards, these are index cards, to um, give you a better understanding of that. So if the wind's blowing across, this card will move out slightly that way. The layer beneath it will move out in that direction. The layer beneath it will move out in that direction. It's kind of hard to see on camera here. The layer beneath it will move in the other direction. And eventually you come to a layer that's actually moving in the opposite direction. Sorry about that. You should try this at home. It's actually moving in the opposite direction of the surface waters. Grab some 3 by 5 cards and convince yourself of that and recreate this image. So you have a layer moving this direction, this one moving that direction, this one moving that direction, this one moving that direction, that direction, that direction, and so on. These arrows represent the direction of water movement. And because they're vectors, the length of the arrow also indicates the speed of movement. So the faster the water is at the surface, slowest water is at the bottom. Now in looking at this, and this is the reason I want you to use index cards to kind of give yourself some idea of this, if you were to look at this diagram by itself, it's going to make you think that we're talking about a whirlpool, and we're not talking about a whirlpool. The Ekman spiral isn't a spiral in the sense of a spiral staircase or water plummeting down a whirlpool or anything like that. It's only a spiral in the sense that we are talking about layers of water moving in different directions. So there's no whirlpool effect here. Again, surface water moving in one direction, layer beneath that moving in a different direction, even further to the right, the layer beneath that moving even further to the right, the layer beneath that moving either even further to the right, and eventually moving in the opposite direction as you go from the surface down to these lower layers. This is moving that way, this is moving that way, and that's what's depicted in this diagram of the Ekman spiral. What's most important about this explanation is that if we take an average of all these different directions, okay, this going backwards, this going that way, and if we take an average of all the different speeds of the water moving in different directions, what we find is that the average direction and the average flow is about 90 degrees to the right of the wind. Okay, let me repeat that. The average direction, so adding up all the Ekman vectors, adding up all the directions and adding up all the speeds, the average motion of water is going to be, in the northern hemisphere, 90 degrees to the right. I can do it this way too. It, the average motion is going to be 90 degrees to the right of the direction of the wind. That's called Ekman transport. And it's this little piece of information, the mean Ekman transport, that helps us understand upwelling and helps us understand the surface circulation in the world ocean. So again, take a look at this slide, play with some index cards, and each layer of water moving in a different direction and moving at a different speed, when you add all that up, you get a mean flow and direction that's 90 degrees to the right of the wind in the northern hemisphere what would it be in the southern hemisphere? Email me if you don't know the answer. Well, that's it for this podcast. I hope you're learning tons about ocean currents. Have a great day. Bye-bye.